So I'm on 1.1, the structure of Genesis as a whole. So we're, get, we're zoom, going to be zooming in on Genesis 1 to 11. But Genesis as a whole is organized into 10 uh, in Hebrew, toledoth. But that's the word for generation. We get the first heading, chapter 2, verse 4, translated as this is the account. Literally, this is the generation of the heavens and the earth. Normally, it's a family uh, coming after this. The, in this case, it's an analogy to, of that. Chapter uh, 5, verse 1 is the next one. And I've got the, got the rest there. So we get 10 of these kind of headings. The book itself doesn't start with one of these headings. So it's like we've got chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 3 as one thing. Like a prologue, I guess we could say. And then we get 10, 10 generations, 10, 10 large, quite, <clears throat> quite large episodes. So it's like a prologue followed by 10 episodes. Uh, the person who is usually named, chapter 2, verse 4, isn't a person. It's just what the heavens and the earth kind of produced. Chapter 5, verse 1, this is the generation of Adam's family line. And it's going to focus in on his family and what happened uh, there. So it marks a transition to a new section. And then we get a new group of people. And it's organised in ten of these. That's Genesis as a whole. Coming to Genesis 1 to 11, it's what, what we just uh, did. It's narratives into which these genealogies are being interspersed. Narratives interspersed with genealogies. Outside the Bible, we have some other texts, other ancient texts that are organized in the same way. I've written that, the name of those down for you, the Assyrian king, king lists. They're another uh, example of a text being organized in this, this way. Uh, narratives, be, well, actually, they're, they're the other way. They're long genealogies being interspersed with shorter narratives, Genesis is another take on the same way of writing up, up uh, an account. It's large narratives into which these genealogies are being interspersed. Uh, the way, I guess, of us being able to see the fact that the text is coming as narrative and genealogy, we can still have it as one text because we have these other examples outside. They, they, they're one text even though they're made up of two different genres. So coming to 1.3, the structure of the narratives themselves. So Genesis as a whole organized as 10 generations. Genesis 1 to 11 organized narratives interspersed with genealogies. Now zooming in on the narratives themselves, those narratives are coming in an organized way, and the uh, technical term for those is that they're chiastic. So you can see that in the, in the heading I've given you there, a chiastic storytelling. So a chiasm is, it comes from the Greek, word, Greek letter chi, which is X, and an X is like that. Goes, so first half of the letter, then there's an before it turns the other way. So these, <coughs> these narratives are like, like an X. We move into a center before we move out from that center in a parallel way. So what happens at the start gets repeated at the end. What happens after that start, the second thing, gets repeated as the second last thing. You get what I mean. You can see, see I've written them out for you, so, so that's easy to follow. So the first, first large narrative encompasses chapter 2, verse, after the heading of verse 4, chapter 2, verse 5, through to the end of chapter 3. And, and we're getting these, these narratives and then dialogue. And the centre of the narrative uh, is chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. What's going on there? It is, and, but moving into chapter 3, where we've got 
the man and the... See, see how God is now absent at, at the centre of the narrative and that's where they then eat the fruit and commit the sin. So, so what's going on here is that the structure of the text is highlighting for us what, what is important to this uh, narrative. And that's the fact that the man and the, women, <coughs> man and the woman are committing the sin. It's not the only thing that the text is saying, but, but by its structure, that, that's what it's highlighting, highlighting to us as important. Second narrative is, is the one in chapter 4, Cain and Abel. And actually the same thing is being highlighted by the structure. So it's where Cain and Abel are alone in the field and Cain kills his brother. So two narratives highlighting sin, after which we get another genealogy. Then, <clears throat> then we get the flood account after the, the narrative that heads into that, which isn't a chiasm. But the flood account itself is. And this one is different. They, there's still sin here uh, in the story, but that's not what the structure itself is signalling as what it wants to highlight. What it wants to highlight is where God remembers Noah, which then is not sin but grace. Grace is present in the other two narratives preceding, but that's not what the structure itself is highlighting. This one now is highlighting the fact that God remembers Noah, and this is then the turning, whole turning point in the flood. The rain stops after this now. Uh, and then chapter 11, the Tower of Babel account. Same things are present as before, but now it's chapter 11, verse 5. That's, that's the center. And <clears throat> that's where God comes down to see the city and the tower the people were building, which is not him coming down to like check it out. It's him coming down in judgment. So judgment is present in the first, second, and third narratives. But, it's, but they're not what the narrative is highlighting. This last one is highlighting God coming in judgment. So <clears throat> sin, sin, genealogy, grace, genealogy, judgment, and then after the Tower of Babel, we get another genealogy. And that's, that's our text. Chapters 1 to 11. So, so sin... Uh, grace, uh, judgment. They, these actually, they, each narrative is, is showing us what's important to it, but putting them all together, actually these are the th things that are important to Genesis 1 to 11 as a whole, the themes of this text. It's saying sin is a universal problem. Uh, God is a God who shows grace, but he must also punish the wicked. Sin is a huge problem. God is a God who shows grace, but he has to punish the wicked. And the only hope for humanity is actually what the flood account highlights, and that's God's grace. And the question then Genesis 1 to 11 as a whole asks is, will God's final word be a word of judgment or not? That's a hanging question as we finish chapters 1 to 11. Uh, humanity at the end of chapter 11 seems to be getting nowhere. Um, <clears throat> so we get new heading, chapter 11, verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Uh, get Abraham, Abram as part of that, that family. Uh, verse 30, Sarah, Sarai, ha uh, Abram's wife was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, grandson Lot, uh, Lot son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law daughter Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to, to Haran, they settled there. So the, this idea of unable to produce an offspring and unable to get to a place, that's where Genesis chapter 11 is, is finishing. So humanity seems to be getting nowhere because this family tree, unable to reach Canaan and unable to produce an offspring.
there's a crisis of people and place, all because God's rule has been rejected. That's where chapter 11 finishes. That's an unfinished story. Any questions so far? <clears throat> no. All right, 1.4. <clears throat> so here I've got a reoccurring pattern. So within these narratives, we get the same basic ingredients. So in the fall account, chapter 3, we get a sin, obviously. And then God makes a speech. And then he gives a sign of grace. In this case, it's 3 verse 21. Uh, he gives them clothes. After which then the punishment takes place. And that pattern repeats. So Cain and Abel, there's a sin, there's a speech, a sign of grace, and then the punishment is carried out. Same with uh, the narrative at the start of chapter 6. <coughs> uh, same with the flood account. And I've included here Babel. Um, because that's what people get, give as another example, but I'm not convinced of that. Because see how with Babel, the grace comes outside that narrative is the suggestion. It's in it's chapter 10. Chapter 10 in my Bible is before chapter 11. <laughs> so <clears throat> chapter 10 is the table of nations. It's how it's kind of like a map of the world at that time and <clears throat> if it appeared after chapter 11 it would be read as a sign of judgment which I, st I think chapter 11 is like a flashback explaining how it is that they spread out uh, so that's why I think it's not the grace of the of the of the Tower of Babel account and cha actually chapter 11 then supplies the reason it's it's actually reluctant obedience that they, they're spreading out. They actually didn't want to. They were grouping together and trying to s stay together. So <clears throat> there's a con constant pattern that I'm wanting you to see. In the midst of judgment, God is showing grace. Every time, apart from probably the Babel account. And I'll return to that idea later. So basically, the summary then, you could say, where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. I think that's a good summary for Genesis 3 to 11. Why is there punishment after grace? Um, in, because the, the, pun, the punishment, in, at least for chapter 3 and 4, um, is it like them getting banished? Well, then, then they're not around to receive any. <laughs> they're, they're kicked out, so they're out. So before they're sent out, God gives God in His presence. Then, before punishment, He's giving them. In their case, in the first case, the clothes that they need in order to live outside the garden. All right, <clears throat> let's zoom in a bit more. Chapter 1 then. Did you all come for chapter 1? Chapter 1 and chapter 6. <laughs> I'm not going to do chapter 6. Um, <clears throat> so creation, chapter 1. Um, but we need to kind of think about what kind of text is it? Um, because what type of text, the question of what kind of text is it, is one then that you have, a, have in your mind, and that's what you kind of bring to the text often. So you just some people decide what it is, and then that's that's the grid into which uh, they read what's going on in chapter one. So I've written here some options. Uh, some people think it's a mythological account, just like another um, account for how people got here and what we do uh, and that kind of thing um, out there. There's different views on this, so that it's, it's like a fictional account to make sense of reality. And that's where they'll read it against other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts and, and things like that. 
but Jesus did refer to creation as something historical. And really, we did arrive somehow. And I think this then is the text that's explaining that for us. It, it, it can't, we can't reduce it to mythology and write it off in that kind of way. Uh, other people think it's a poetic account. And there is poetry in Genesis chapter 1, one verse of it. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. You can see how it's indented. It's probably indented in your Bible and laid out as poetry that you would encounter in Psalms or, or something like that. So that verse is poetry. I'll look at that one a bit more later. The rest of it is is any uh, is written like any other narrative account that we'd read in the Old Testament. And actually, Hebrew has a verb form that's pretty much reserved for writing a written written narrative account, and that's the verb form that's used throughout this text from chapter one, verse three. That's the first use of it, and it just keeps repeating. So it's not poetry like we would encounter in Psalms. Verse 27 is that. The rest of it's not. Um, so we can't write it off in that kind of way. Some people think it's a scientific account. That is, it, it's giving the detailed uh, steps uh, of the creation process uh, in a and it maps to modern science, that kind of thing. Maybe it does, uh, maybe it doesn't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, some people think it's a polemical account, that is, it's written for the purpose of cr uh, critiquing other ancient creation accounts around at the time. However, there's differences, and I think they mean it's saying, it's saying and doing its own thing. Its its purpose is it can't be only uh, written to counter other things, and maybe Genesis is earlier. So then, yeah, well then that, that's a problem for that. Uh, the problem is that a genre is being identified, a type of writing or the style it is, and then Genesis is being read against that. There's we kind of have to do this, but. Uh, there's a problem or a circular argument to it as well. Uh, so I want to suggest a couple of ways forward for you to think about, and they're on the notes there. So a phenomenal or ordinary account. Phenomenal just means ordinary. Uh, phenomenon. So the, it just, I want to suggest it's using the language Ordinary language of appearance and human experience. The kind of language an average human being would use. We do this all the time. Um, <clears throat> so we might talk about the sky that's above the earth. Uh, or the rainbow. Or the sun rising. In each, each case, scientifically, we're factually wrong. Um, Scientifically, the Earth is actually around, and the sky surrounds the Earth. So it's not the sky is actually above the Earth, because it's sur surrounding the Earth. And the sun moves across the sky. Um, <coughs> uh, well, it doesn't do that, but it's because the Earth is on an axis, and it, it's rotating. The sun is not the one that's moving. And the rainbow is actually a rain circle. So if we're actually able to view the whole thing, it's a circle, not a bow. But we weren't making a scientific assessment. We were just describing it using the ordinary language that we have available. Uh, and so I, I want to suggest that Genesis is doing something of the same kind of thing. It's using ordinary human language of human experience. It's not technical or academic, and we don't have to have finally arrived at the modern era where we have science at a, at, at a certain level, that now we kind of know what's going on. I want to suggest that anybody, any ancient reader up to the present day can read it and make sense of it.
as well, I want to suggest it's also analogical and an anthropomorphic account. So when God's, God's reveal, using language in the Bible and revealing uh, himself to us, it's analogical and anthropomorphic always at the same time. So it's by analogy. That is, it's not entirely identical or entirely different. There's some analogy that's, that's there. As well, it's anthropomorphic. It's com accommodated and, and written in a way that we can understand from our perspective. So uh, an anthropomorphism, God is, a Bible will say, well, even in this, this text here, God rests. So it's an analogy and, and an anthropomorphism. His resting is somehow similar and analogous to our resting, but it can't be the same. So it can't be saying God is resting because he gets tired. But we, we will rest because we get tired. Uh, but it is saying he, he rests, and so it's saying... It's yeah, it's describing in human terms something about what is happening for God. And so we can understand something about God accurately by the analogy and the anthropomorphism. But the reality is going to be bigger than what we actually can understand. I'll talk about him resting soon. The creation account as a whole, I want to suggest, is an analogical and an anthropomorphic account. It's written from God's perspective. It's his... We're, human beings don't have the first work week. God has the first work week. It's his, not ours. And the Israelites' work week then is going to be patterned in Exodus after God's work week. He's the first worker, <coughs> taking six days, and then he rests. And maybe, you know, this is exactly as it occurred, but it's not so clock-focused because it's an uh, uh, analogical and an anthropomorphic account. It's presenting him as a worker, going about his work week. That's what it's saying, at, at the very least. It can be saying more, but I want to get what's actually there. <clears throat> Any questions? Probably. <laughs> Can you explain anthropomorphic again, please? Yeah, so it's, it's describing <coughs> uh, God using words that are appropriate for human beings. Describing him as somebody who needs rest. Uh, that he changes his mind, mind, or he gets angry, these kinds of things. We, we know what those things are like because we are human beings, and so we can kind of relate to it, but there's going to, going to be a fullness of reality that's bigger than what we're, we're kind of grasping at, trying to describe God. Is there a day that you start a 24-hour day? Don't know. It, it's written, in the account, it's written as if it is, yes. Yep. And I'm happy for it to be the case. The, <coughs> day, day seven, though, is not 24 hours. It goes on forever. God is still, he hasn't returned to the set, he hasn't started day, week number two. So the seventh day is ongoing and the expectation is that human beings now will do their work. Many more weeks of work though, but at some point their work will be complete and they then can join God in, in the rest that he's reached. Yeah, in the unique way that, that 
chapter one is presenting, yes. So he'll, he'll still go on um, providentially upholding creation. So it's not like he's doing nothing, but he doesn't need to, yeah, create. That's been done. And it's complete on day six. Day six. Yes. So it's no different, right? Yes, that's right. Yep. <coughs> All right, coming to 2.2. <coughs> Del deliberately, what time are we at? Uh, crafted account. So I've, I've said it's not po poetical. That's not, that doesn't mean that there's uh, creative things going on. So here's, here's some of them. So it comes as seven days, right? So seven already is a feature of the text. There's seven, seven days. Uh, once we start looking, then the word seven, or the number seven is used repeatedly. The word day, so there's seven days. The word itself day is, occurs 14 times. That's a multiple of seven. Uh, the word earth occurs 21 times and the word God occurs 35 times. So day occurs 14, earth 21, God 35 times and then phrases start occurring seven as multiples of seven and it was so occurs seven times and God saw that it was good occurs seven times but actually something creative has to happen with that because on days uh, three and six there's two acts of creation so <clears throat> so verse nine starts uh, the third day and God said and we get an act of creation verse 11 then God said we get a second act of creation and in both cases, he sees that it's good, verse 10 and verse 12, right? Same happens on day six, but none on day two. That's, so it's not that God didn't see what he, he created on day two as not good, but if it used that phrase on day two as well, well, then we've got eight times that phrase is used. So it leaves it out on day two so that we can have a multiple of seven overall, I think. Um, <clears throat> the first verse itself, if we count in Hebrew, is seven words. The second verse is 14 words. The seventh day, that, that is Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3, all the work, when we count up the words that are to do with the seventh day is 35 words, which again is a multiple of seven. And if we count all of the words together from verse one to chapter two, verse three, we get 469 words, which you can divide by seven. I can't do that in my head, but <clears throat> that means the, all of these details, um, the amount of them, if it was just a few of them, I'd, I'd have a question mark myself. But, but because there's so many, I'm, I'm convinced that we're meant to see these things such that, you know, if you added too much more detail about one thing, then all of it's not going to add up to the right number now. So, so it means you've, you've got to have spent a long time uh, getting all the details right to say what you want to say in the amount of words that has to kind of divide by seven. Yep. Sorry? No. Yeah, that's probably going too far. <laughs> <laughs> I'm normally skeptical of this kind of thing, but with this text. Um, have I heard of Ivan somebody? Pannon. 
And that, my answer was a no. A question yep. English. How does that relate to with it, whether it's in a different language or in Spanish or French? You know, do you see these same patterns if it's translated into a different language? Does that work to you to use different words for translation? Yeah, I wouldn't do the I wouldn't do the counting on a translation because it's one, one step removed. So I'd say the the author's intent will be coming via the translation, but you're not going to, going to be able to get this level of detail. This is kind of baked into the original text that just cannot be conveyed in a translation. So when we're reading it in English? Yeah, you won't know. And, and it will be, if, if it is doing something like this, that's just random. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's conveying the fact that God is ordered in what he does overall. So the the just as the human author has laboured over this text and produced a very crafted and orderly account. He, he's trying to mimic something of what God has done. He's trying to describe in a kind of godlike way what God has done in creation. That's my hunch, but yeah. <clears throat> so it's not poetry. But you can see how this narrative is unlike other narratives. Then it's it's very ordered and yeah deliberate in what it says. Um, and so coming to two point three, a significant refrain, and God said, "Let there be." We can just read over that quickly and miss what's going on. It's actually the the bit in the text that really helps us along, I think. And God said, let there be, it occurs a number of times. Um, <clears throat> now we've got, we've got our terminology. This is uh, metaphorical. It's an anthropomorphism, picturing God as a speaker with a mouth, saying the words, let there be, such and such. So God, God doesn't have a literal mouth but he's pictured as a speaker of certain words. That's what's, that's what's going on. It's a, the, there's a picture that's being presented and we have to just pause and ask what is the picture that's being presented to us by having God speak. And it's this kind of phrase, let there be light or uh, let there be a vault, these, these kinds of things. And that, that then being carried out. Um, <clears throat> and when I think about it, I think there's only one uh, thing that would come to the, the mind of an ancient reader, and that is this picture of God speaking the words like this is a picture of an ancient Near Eastern king. So <clears throat> in the ancient world, the king, and in some parts of the world today, the king is the high, has the highest authority. The king is the law. He's the one who issues decrees and they have to be carried out and if you don't carry it out you know big trouble we in Australia we have a different system Th those in authority are still under the law but in the ancient world and in some parts of the world the person at the top everybody else has to follow what they say uh, our prime minister can't issue a decree and expect it to be carried out but that's different. Uh, the, the picture here is different. So the picture of God's word is a picture of God the king, I think. So he, he's the king issuing decrees and they have to be carried out by virtue of his authority. So there's the authority or what we could say the sovereignty of God or what I'm getting to, the, the kingship of God. And so if we've got the kingship of God, 
if God is being presented as the king, then by implication, I think there must be a kingdom. So this significant refrain, and God said, let there be, is helping, is cluing us into what's going on in the text. God is, God is the king, and what's going on is he's setting up his kingdom as he's creating. Any questions? Yeah, that, um, <clears throat> so the question is, what's, is there any significance to the fact that uh, the end of the day or, you know, the end of each day is recorded as, and there was evening and there was morning, whichever day. <clears throat> and I think the answer is that it's a different way of viewing the beginning and end of a day in that culture. So the, it's kind of an overlap at the start of the day, is that, is that what's going on, where as the one, one, the next day begins as the other one ends. That's a bit weird on the first one, but yeah. Once we're after the first one, then it, it works. Okay, so 2.4, the pattern of creation which is forming and filling. So we've got the theme of the kingdom being the theme in the text, that is the kingdom of God, <coughs> present behind the phrase, and God said in issuing a command, and that, that is not challenged, it's carried out. And that's, that theme of the kingdom is also reinforced, what I'm going to su suggest, in the structure of the text. So the, the text itself is coming, of Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> coming to us with firstly three days where God forms something and then in the next three days he's basically filling that space that he created. So there's a form and then a filling or what we could call a habitat and then he's placing inhabitants within those habitats or if we want to use the, the kingdom uh, terminology, he's, he's kind of setting up kingdoms or realms into which then he's placing rulers to rule those spaces. So it's organised as <coughs> two groups of three, uh, each of which is working to solve the problem that's introduced in chapter 1 verse 2. So where we have the earth being formless, that is without form, and it being empty. It's lacking filling. So it needs to be formed and it needs to be filled. And the first three days are creating forms in a sense. The next three days after that, filling those spaces. Um, <clears throat> and the way the account then is written helps to reinforce the fact that they're coming as two groups of three, where day three has two acts of creation, which I mentioned before, verse 9, verse 11, and then, <coughs> and then day 6 um, has two acts of creation that then match. Uh, verse 24, verse 26. Um, <coughs> In verse 16, if you have come there, so this is the first, uh, first place, first time he's uh, creating the ruler for a realm, and the language of rule is explicit then. So he's making the two great lights, the greater light, see, to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. So the purpose for which the, the um sun and the moon are being put into the, into the realm of the sky, or the day and the night, is to then rule that space. Uh, then after that we've got the sea creatures and the sky creatures. It says birds in you know, NIV, but it's anything that's flying in the sky. It can be bats or whatever. 
uh, and with them, he's blessing them and saying, be fruitful, this is verse 22, uh, be fruitful, increase in number, uh, and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And so this language of multiplying and increasing can be taken as, you know, if you're filling that space, multiplying and filling that space, you're ruling that space. And so those two things, the language of rule and the language of being fruitful and multiplying, separate, the language is kept separate on, on day four and day five, but it combines on day six with mankind, where the language of rule is there in verse 28, or verse 26 and verse 28, <clears throat> as well as the language of being fruitful and increasing and filling the earth and subduing it. So he's creating certain things, placing them in a certain realm to rule that realm. Mankind created last, I think, to rule over the, over the land, but in a sense to rule over the whole thing. And that's what verse 26 says. So God's setting up his kingdom and then he's placing inhabitants in those realms to rule on his behalf in those spaces. Any questions? Uh, I don't know. Because we've only got the sun being created on day four. So this is one of the problems, yeah. So whether that's, that, that can be a clue in the text that we're not to take it, we're meant to kind of overlap them. Yeah. Some people who, who will see this as, as giving the exact order of things and scientific will say uh, what's going on with... So the sun and the moon cr actually created on the first day, but they're only being... What do they say? The, the clouds get blown away and they can start to function as light bearers in, on, on day four. That's one, one way that they try to solve it. Maybe that's creative. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, the seventh day, <coughs> different from the other days, there's no creating on this day, so then that, that's uh, separate. But leading up to this, we've got the structure, two groups of three, reinforcing the kingdom theme. This leads to the seventh day. Seventh day, God rests from his work. He's finished the work of creation. And so some kind of image uh, is being presented here. It can't be God is getting tired and needs to go to bed. <coughs> so I think the better way to take it is God's been establishing his kingdom. There's been a rising chain of command, becoming more personal, stars and sun and so forth. They're just aspects of creation. They're not personal beings. We've got personal beings on day five. Well, <clears throat> animate beings, let's say. Day six, the second act of creation with mankind. Now we've got human beings that God can speak directly to and relate, relate to and they're to rule over the whole thing. So there's been a rising chain of command, finishing with mankind. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't stop there. Day seven, we've got God, not just like a creature king. We've got the actual king of creation pictured here. And I think the idea of him resting is him taking his seat to rule. Uh, we've got a parallel text in Psalm 132. 32, I've written it in your notes. Uh, this is my resting place forever and ever. Talking about when he enters uh, the temple that Solomon's made. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned for I have desired it. So resting and rule are going together here. And re rule definitely is there in the other six days. Now we've got rest as well. So it's God... Finish, having finished the, the work of creation, able to enjoy it, but also able to rule now over the whole kingdom that he set up. 
Uh, so he's taking his seat to rule, I think, on the seventh day. So the main takeaways, uh, just in summary quickly. Uh, one, a self-existent, all-powerful God, eternal God, is assumed in the text. He's, he just appears in verse 1. There's no backstory. And from the point of view of the text, I think that it doesn't require explanation because that God just is. We can't, can't kind of go back to a beginning for God. That's part of what it means to be God. And so from the point of view of this, this text, the origin of God is, a, is irrelevant. That's a human point of view. So self-existent, all-powerful God <coughs> who's eternal is assumed. Secondly, creation is formed from nothing. As human beings, we have to use some substance, right? We have to take some kind of material out of which we then make something. In this text, we've got a God who is so powerful, he can take the raw material of nothing and make a whole universe out of it. And when it says, so when it says, in the beginning, God, he's the only one there. There's nothing else there. Uh, thirdly, creation springs into existence effortlessly. It's, it's no effort for God. It's simply him saying some words that are not careless or accidental, but it's still just words. And that's how it's created. We have to kind of put in a whole heap of effort and energy. He can just issue a command and it's there. Uh, fourthly, creation is good, which means it's good doesn't necessarily have to mean perfect. Because when he says good about, uh, when's the first time it's used? Verse 4. It can't mean perfect there because he's still got things to do. He only says very good on day 6. So there's improvement throughout the days. And I think there's ex the expectation for improvement uh, after the seventh day. Creation and the other animals and so forth are not immediately filling their spaces and ruling them, but at some point they will, which will be better, in a sense, than what it was before. Uh, <clears throat> so I think good for the purposes for which it was created is a good way of thinking about it which in another way of thinking can be perfect anyway. It, matches, it matched what God wanted. And then only when humanity turns up, God says, very good. So they're the high point. So coming to five, humanity formed in the image of God, which means two things I want to suggest. So it's this delegated authority or delegated rule. That's chapter 1, verse 26. I've written it in your notes there. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, see, so that they may rule. Image, entail, image of God entails rule on his behalf here. So it's the capacity, image of God entails the capacity to rule and they're given the responsibility to do that. As well, verse 27, and now this is where I was going to, is this going to work? So it's in your notes, but it didn't, the colour didn't come out. Um, so <coughs> I'll just give an explanation to start with. So it's there, it's there in the corner. Um, so the way Hebrew poetry works is that it doesn't rhyme sounds, like where we can be used to poetry rhyming sounds. Hebrew poetry works by rhyming ideas. So it says one line, and then it'll say another line, not using the exact same words, but using uh, a, like a rhyming idea. 
This is how verse 27 is working. We're getting three lines of poetry, which are then duplicating the idea, same idea, in each line. So God created mankind in the image of God. So there's one, two, three, four things being said there. God, the subject of the verb, the verb create, is creating human beings in a certain way, in the image of God. And those four ideas repeated in each line. Second line just reorders it. In the image of God, <coughs> he created him, that is man. So we're getting pronouns now referring back to the previous line, but it's the same things being mentioned. The last line then, un I think, unpacks the two previous lines. And so now we don't have the words image of God being used. Now that's unpacked as male and female. That's kind of how Hebrew poetry works. It's rhyming ideas. So the idea is present in the last line, but now it's, it's kind of explained. So um, image of God entails the capacity to rule. Adding to that idea, verse 27, it's the ability to relate or the capacity to relate. Human beings inherently relational, made for relationship with God and with each, with each other here. And then sixthly, the goal of creation is rest. And that create, uh, completes the creation week. That's where it's heading. And that's even before the fall. And God resting, there's the invitation to join him in that rest. That's chapter one. Move on to chapter two. <clears throat> well, chapter two uh, to chapter three, this is the first narrative. And Hebrew narratives often get, we get two parallel accounts. So the story is told once and then told a second time. And this is kind of what happens with, with chapter two. We're getting, I don't know what to, an, is it another creation account? I don't really want to say that. A complementary, a complementary account. And here we're getting a place. So it's, it, there's creation as a whole, chapter one. Chapter two, it's narrow, narrowing down to a certain part of that, that larger place. Now we're getting a special garden called Eden. So the perspective is quite geographical now. We're getting rivers mentioned and so forth. So God's working out his purposes in small and specific ways. And we're getting people. Now, now when they're introduced, we're getting God's name appearing. So verse Chapter 2, verse 4, see how it's Lord in small caps? That tells you it's not Lord as in master, but Lord as in name. So Yahweh, maybe. So there's an intimacy between Adam and God. He's, he's not just God, creator, but he's the personal God who has a name. And he gives the human beings, and specifically Adam, a responsibility. So chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So given a responsibility, here it will be, what can we say, live in obedience to what God says. They can, they're free to eat from any tree except one. There's a command not to. Uh, adding to that verse 18, uh, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So live in obedience to God's word. Now it's live in relationship as they 
might rule creation on God's behalf. So <clears throat> live in obedience, live in relationship. And verse 15 helps us as well. Gives us the purpose for why he's putting them in the garden, or putting the man in the garden. Uh, he took the man <clears throat> and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And whenever those two words occur together, working and taking care, it's usually what priests uh, do in the Old Testament. They're the ones who work or serve. And what I want to suggest is a better translation to guard it. Um, <clears throat> it's the same word that the cherubim uh, put out the front of Eden. Uh, the, the purpose of that, verse chapter 3, verse 24, where he drives a man out, places on the east side cherubim, a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard or to keep the way to the tree of life. Um, so <clears throat> you can look at the, the end of Numbers chapter 1 where the Levites are given, the Le Levitical priests given responsibility to uh, <clears throat> care for uh, the, the tabernacle and if anyone gets too close they're to be put to death and in combination with that is the same phrase they're to guard that tabernacle so combination here points to the fact that Adam is not just a king of creation chapter 1 which he is he's also a priest of creation he has access to God in the garden God walks in the, in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam can be there with him. See, He's like a priest. He has access to a holy place where the holy God is. And that carries a responsibility. He is to guard that place like the priests later were to do. At this point, we wonder, who, what, you know, who does he have to guard the place from? But uh, chapter 3 quickly moves to somebody he should be guarding it from. <laughs> so responsibility, <clears throat> as well as a temptation. So see how the temptation works. Um, uh, chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 1, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So it starts with a question about God's word, and he's getting her to question it and evaluate it and in a sense move to sit in judgment upon it it's quite a from his point of view it's a good strategy it's okay so so the word that created life in chapter one god's word is one in chapter three the snake is trying to get her to be able to question that word evaluate it see and form a judgment about it and so it's sad what happens. She says to the serpent, trying to retaliate, but there's subtle changing that, that goes on. She says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, which is kind of what God said, but it's, less, uh, it's more restrictive. God said, eat fruit. You may freely eat from all the trees. She, she, she just says, eat fruit from the trees. It's, it's, not, it's kind of not as many trees. Um, <clears throat> you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. So he's more harsh in what he says. He never said anything about touching it, but she's saying that's what he said. So his word is more harsh than what it actually is. That might, might be a wise thing to do, not to get too close to it. But she's add, she has, should, should be recognising what she's doing. She's adding to it th at that point. And then there's also this changed consequence. It's just die. She just says die rather than certainly die. So the consequence is less severe, I guess. That's the temptation. It's moving to, to get her to question and evaluate God's word which is then 
what happens and, and that then, then leads into the uh, sin that, that occurs where they do eat fruit from the tree. And so what is the, this kind of knowledge of good and evil? Uh, I just copied something out there for you. <clears throat> so knowledge of good and evil does not mean knowing about good and evil. They already knew that they should not eat uh, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, nor does it mean experiencing good and evil, since God himself knows good and evil. What it means is determining for oneself what is good and evil. It means deciding what is right. Uh, therefore creating our own morality. Adam and Eve decided to live their lives their own way without God. This is what defines sin. Sin is doubting the word of God and choosing to live without God. In effect, we knock God off his throne and put ourselves in his place. We decide to be gods for ourselves. So this sin of being our own boss and ruler leads then to the sin then of breaking God's command but it's starting with the kind of desire there. Right, so far? Uh, <clears throat> after which we get a promise. So chapter 3, verse 15. I've written it out uh, from the ESV. Um, I forget what the difference is, but reading the ESV, I will put enmity, God says, between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his, he his heel. Offspring uh, in Hebrew is the word seed. And <coughs> it's what we can call a collective singular. So it's grammatically singular. It's like English seed which, or offspring, which might refer to one as well as a group. So here I think it's referring to a group in the first line. So the text is imagining coming after the woman and the snake. There's going to be people from the woman as well as, I guess, people who line up up, up behind the snake. There's going to be a battle in history between Satan and Eve's seed, not little, like literal snakes, but people who are siding with what Satan is wanting to do in the world. And actually, that's what we see in the next chapter, chapter 4, where we can think of Abel as the seed of the woman and Cain as, the, as like a seed of the snake. And where then, see, the godly seed of Eve is persecuted and put to death. That prediction and promise is made in chapter 3, verse 15. That's going to play out through history, is what God is saying. There's going to be a spiritual battle in time and place. But that's not going to go on forever. The second half of the verse says there's going to be somebody who ends that ongoing battle. There's going to be a climactic battle and end at, at some point where someone, he, shall bruise your head, that is the serpent's head, and you shall bruise his heel. So it's actually the same. <coughs> Maybe that's why I put it in. It's actually the same verb in Hebrew that's used. So there's going to be a bruising on the head or a crushing on the head and a crushing on the heel. And so it's only the location that's different. Obviously, a snake bite on the heel is going to be pretty severe but a crushing on the head is going to be more severe. But you get, the one who defeats the serpent, this is saying, will himself suffer some kind of, in some kind of way. So the battle between Eve's seed and, the sa <coughs> and Satan's seed narrows down to a singular battle, which we know uh, happens in the New Testament and where Jesus does die, but he rises to life. He's like, it's like he get, gets crushed on the foot, which is severe, but in that he defeats uh, Satan. That's the promise. God didn't have to make the promise in 3.15, but once he's made that promise, now it's, it's kind of locked in. This is, this is what's going to happen. Uh, 3.7, judgment <coughs> still has to take place. So because of sin, 
uh, God's people not able to live in a special place with him and so they are removed from the blessing of being with him. And the rest of the Bible is how to kind of get back to Eden. It's going to involve going through, you know, chapter 3, verse 24, this flaming sword that's flashing around everywhere. It's possible to get back into Eden, but you're going to get pretty cut up and burnt. That's, that's the way forward. It's, so the rest of the Bible is the story of how to get back through that flaming sword past the cherubim. So being a creature now means being at odds with creation and not ruling it or enjoying it like they could have in the beginning. That's, that's the judgment, as well as blessing. Uh, so because God does what he does in chapter 3, verse 15, that is, he doesn't turn up in full and final judgment, which would have been his right. He doesn't do that. Uh, only Satan is cursed. Humans aren't cursed. Satan, well, Satan and the ground are, are cursed. Uh, God even clothes them for life outside the garden. Must mean he still has a plan for them. So there's blessing even though there's judgment and curse. That's chapters 2 and 3. Here we go. So chapters four, <coughs> 4 to 11, what I'm suggesting is where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So some themes and patterns, picking up some speed. So, so sin spreads. So once it happens, it's like it's infectious then. And we can think of it as like an avalanche or a growing bushfire. So an avalanche starts with something small and just gets bigger and bigger as it goes down. And that's kind of what happens. It, it's growing in intensity, sin does in Genesis 4 to 11. So it's starting with disobedience, chapter 3, murder, chapter 4, and by the end, human beings are not just doing isolated sin. Now they're in on it together with the Tower of Babel account. Organising themselves collectively against God. Uh, we <coughs> also get this theme of the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the snake. So the first Toled Oath... The generation, that is, chapter 2, verse 4, the generation of the heavens and the earth, has produced offspring, one of whom is Abel, who was murdered. <coughs> his brother is a murderer. He's punished. And his line at the end of chapter 4 is marked by extreme violence. This is Lamech there. And Seth, verse 26. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So the, there's an emphasis on the seventh in these genealogies. <coughs> uh, the seventh, first seventh from Adam is Lamech. And you can see how he's boasting about how he's going to kill somebody younger than him for wounding him. It's all about blood vengeance and stuff. So a family line characterised by hate and violence. And then, <clears throat> then the seventh in the next genealogy uh, is Enoch, verse 21. Introduced there. <coughs> Verse 24, he walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. So one family line characterised by hate and violence and death. Another line characterised by walking with God and somebody who doesn't die. Um, and actually within this second genealogy of ch chapter 5, and we get another Lamech, see verse 28. 
that's a different LUMEC from verse 23. And this LUMEC is different, has the same name. And he's speaking like the previous LUMEC, but now he's expressing a longing for the curse to be removed. See, see the language? Uh, he's, uh, he's hoping that his son will comfort us in the labour and painful toil, th those words only used here in, in back in chapter 3, of, of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. So the hope is that, that the tenth uh, person from Adam, Noah, would be the one to reverse the curse. That, see, there's a hope that God would keep his promise of Genesis 3.15. Uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 29. So it, it, there's a deliberate linking. So that, that word painful toil, only used here, and that's the same word painful, the, the labor pains, and that he's going to, Adam's going to have painful labor when he works the ground. So this Lamech is expressing a hope that the curse would be removed. Uh, <clears throat> as well, we're getting this refrain in chapter 5. Eight times in chapter 5, and he died. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. So in the family tree where death is being emphasised, someone, Enoch, is able to escape it. There's a hint that death does not have to be inevitable. Because Enoch is an example, he, he didn't die. Maybe God can do it again. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so coming to 4.2, God's covenant with Noah, which I want to suggest to you as a covenant of, of common grace. So we can have, <clears throat> have special grace coming to people as well as common grace coming to people. Special grace will be something that's undeserved, therefore it's grace, but it's coming to somebody uh, whom God has chosen, say, one of his people. Common grace is, is common. It's still undeserved, it's, but it's common. It's not reserved for God's special people. And so... Uh, God's covenant with Noah, I want to suggest, is like that. It's in chapter 9. Uh, see how it's between me and the whole earth. And, he's <clears throat> and it's going to provide a certain level of water and predictability. God's not just going to dish out this extreme judgment by a flood again. So it's providing a certain <clears throat> context of order and stability, I think, into which he can work his plan of salvation. Covenant with Noah is a covenant of common grace. So there can be human flourishing into which God can then work his plan of salvation. It's actually back in chapter 3. So common, I've, I've written there, common grace that's already present in Genesis 3.16. Um, well, 3.16 and 3.18 and 19. So, yes, childbearing will be painful and marriage will be painful, but those two things are still going to exist. There still will be marriage and there still will be childbearing. <coughs> There's common blessing after the fall. There still will be marriage and, and uh, childbearing. And for Adam, there will still be work. Yes, it will be frustrated, but there, will, there still will be work. So it's not absolute curse. There's some measure of satisfaction, but we can't find absolute enjoyment in work and family. There's common blessing and common curse, and it's into that context he works his special 
do, does his special work, um, fulfilling his promise in verse 15. Any questions? I was going to say some more, but I need to try to finish here. So, uh, point five, story that hasn't reached a satisfactory ending yet. So, throughout <coughs> Genesis 3 to 11, there's a running tension, on the one hand, between humans who are now predisposed to sin and oppose God. That's the one hand. On the other hand, no matter how bad human beings become, God remains sovereign and is gracious and he still desires to bless, same as what he was wanting to do in chapter 1. So because of sin in Genesis 3, that's going, that just sets the course for further sin. And because there's further sin, therefore further judgment. Right? Because of sin, that's, that's just now setting tracks for further sin and further judgment. But because God shows grace, he doesn't bring final judgment. That, I think, sets the course now for further grace and the unfolding of his plan to save. So this text then expects us to keep reading to find a satisfactory solution to this tension between human beings keeping on sinning, God wanting to save and bless. Um, immediately, <coughs> well, chapter 11 finishes our, our, the section you're doing at church. Um, and what I've <coughs> been trying to su suggest is that the Tower of Babel account is different to the other narratives where <coughs> there was grace, a, a visible sign of grace within each narrative. People have tried to suggest chapter 10 is the grace at Babel, but chapter 10 is not part of the Babel account itself. So other than the fact that God allows them still to live, there's not grace like there was, no visible sign of grace like the previous narratives. That's one thing. Secondly, the genealogy of, of Shem finishes the, the chapter. And as I started, it's finishing with a crisis of offspring and a crisis of place. See how they, Abram's wife is childless, unable to conceive. It's a crisis of offspring. And they've set out to go to Canaan, but they're unable to get there, there themselves. And so it's a crisis also of place. These things that are problems in the text, the fact that there's no grace at Babel, the fact that this family tree is highlighting the fact that they can't produce an offspring and can't get to a place, all of these things begin to re resolve right at the start of chapter 12, um, which I've written out there for you. <coughs> uh, five times in the, in the short space of three verses, the word bless gets used, and so I've underlined those, and I've highlighted the word land and a great nation. So behind land and nation, see how that's place and people. So as God makes promises to Abraham, he's, he's dealing with the problem of people and place, just pr previously in chapter 11 in the genealogy. And as he's making this promise to bless, this, is, this now is the missing kind of grace ingredient from the Babel account. This is the, God's, this is the grace for Babel, as well as the grace for, that's going to kind of answer some of the problems from the previous number of chapters. Uh, so five times he uses the word bless and Previous, scattered throughout Genesis 3 to 11, is the word curse five times. And so in a short space of uh, three verses, we're getting the word bless. It's, this is the blessing that's going to wind back the curse as God keeps his promise to Abraham. Uh, so a shorthand way of remembering God's promises to Abraham, I've written there for you, lob, land, offspring, blessing. That's, that's what's going on there. And as we arrive at 
Abraham, there's, there's this extreme slowdown in the narrative. Genesis 1 to 11, how many thousand years does that text take into account? I don't know, but it's a long length of time. The next 25 years take 10 chapters to tell. It's like we're on fast, <coughs> yeah, we're going through, the, through time fast to get to chapter 12. This is what the world has been waiting for, chapter, what God's going to do in chapter 12.